Hey everyone, welcome in to a, another daily editorial here on the KE Report. We're going to be talking energy sector and touching more on kind of the old school energy, oil, natural gas with Matt Battiali, editor of the New Energy Investor, published under the Mangrove Investor website, which we will link to in the show notes. Now, Matt, we always tie our discussions in more to the critical minerals discussion because, again, you're the editor of the New Energy Investor, so we tie it into new energy sources, new energy production, but it's always good to touch base on kind of that old school energy. Oil, first and foremost, has largely been trading in a range, but just seems to me that there's a bit more headwinds in the oil price. We saw a big drop to start this week and the price still sitting right around that let's say $67 a barrel level that's at the lower part of this range and that's also with still some ongoing wars U.S. production remains high everyone's saying oh or we have a number of people saying the oil price is going to come back or the world needs more energy yada 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 but Price right now is telling us that this market is showing at least a little weakness. Now, again, $67 a barrel, historically not extremely cheap, but more or less right in the middle of a wide range. Matt, what's your outlook for the oil space? What are some of the key drivers behind this slight pressure on price? Well, thanks for having me, guys. And I love this topic. I really do. And and just to put this in perspective, you know, $65 a barrel, I think, is the three-year low. So we're only $2 a barrel above the low. And <clears throat> typically with a commodity, we would look at, at its cyclicality and say, oh, if we're that close to a three-year low, maybe it's time to go long. And in this case, I would argue that oil couldn't go lower. And there are, I mean, you have two things, really, that I see driving this dynamic. The first one is, U.S. oil production is off the charts, man. It, it, it is all-time highs and, and rising. In the old days, you know, before the shale revolution, we were convinced that we were running out of oil. Every year, the oil production would decline a little bit or maybe it would plateau. Shale is the absolute opposite. I mean, as time goes by, shale operators are getting more efficient. The costs are coming down. And the production just keeps going up and up. It's really interesting to me. Um, Axios just put together a, a chart from the World Bank. And it looks like global supply in, in 2025 is going to hit 105.7 million barrels. And their projection for global demand is 104.6 million barrels. A million barrels matters. If you have a million barrels of excess oil on the market, that, that can sob up a lot of surprise demand. But I think right now what you're seeing is, you know, we talk about China in the context of the global economy. China's economy hasn't been consuming as much oil as it has in the past. And so it doesn't take much reduction in demand and increase in supply for that price to come down. And I think that's why we're seeing oil prices where they are. Well, Matt, as somebody that has followed the oil and gas space as long as you have, literally for decades, and been on the ground, been in a lot of these fields, talked to so many energy companies, do you get the sense, I mean, and this is just a sense that I get, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it, that oil really is a very fungible, it, it, it's very elastic to demand shocks, to supply shocks, and uh, we always hear that the cure for high prices is high prices, the cure for low prices is low prices. But in the oil and gas space, they really do respond because it's so much easier to turn on supply or turn off supply than it is in hard rock mining. Or people will say, yeah, well, the cure for high prices in tungsten is high prices. Well, not really, because it's hard to find, it's hard to source it. But with oil and gas, it really is an up and down cyclical commodity, unlike almost anything else, because it's liquids and it's gases versus hard rocks or, or really hard to extract minerals. Do you find that it's always going to be something where there's going to be bulls and bears? And at one point during the year, they're both going to be right because it's just a whipsaw market. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I mean, you know, in West Texas, I think the time from building the pad to plumbing the well is about four to six weeks. You know, so that if you have a successful oil well, that's how long it takes to put it online. There's no hard rock mine on the planet <laughs> that you can go from, you know, from uh, I think this is where we should put the drill to mining in, in six weeks. Not a chance. 
And so, yeah, it, it does respond very quickly. But there's a there's a, an additional part of that you have to understand when it comes to oil and gas, and that is that there are countries, the OPEC group, that rely solely on oil to finance their government and their government programs. And so, yes, oil is very elastic on to, when it comes to supply and demand, but some of these countries, if oil prices get low, they have to actually produce more to make up a loss in revenue. So in in some cases, so Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, that you can actually get a point where they're producing more oil in low prices, which is actually holding prices down. So the rule of thumb is OPEC cheats. <laughs> yeah, well, we all know that. OPEC cheats and they lie, but boy, oh boy, can they sure produce a lot of oil with this balance then, Matt. It doesn't sound like you see any production slowdowns. So then the demand side of things, are we seeing a global slowdown that is taking off some of that demand side of the equation? Is it China that still is not growing at the same rate that's weaker demand? What's the outlook on the demand side? And is that going to change? Yeah, so the demand numbers are a little harder to get your head around. But here's what I would tell you to look at. We have a hot war in the Middle East. We just saw Israel bomb Iran. This typically would be enough to cause oil prices to rise on nerves, right? You get a little nervous buying, you you know, you, you buy a crude tanker and park it off Singapore just in case, that sort of thing. The idea that we're seeing crude oil prices sitting near their three-year lows with the sort of war going on in the Middle East right now tells me that there's a lot more weakness in demand than we can see in the numbers, right? That's the way I'm reading what I'm reading. And when you have this much weakness, here's what I'm concerned about. This is what I said in the beginning where I said I I thought we could see oil prices go lower. Saudi Arabia, the OPEC countries need oil prices at $100 a barrel to fund their government and their social programs. The last time we saw the U.S. really setting records for domestic production and the price of oil started to get weak, Saudi Arabia declined to protect the crude oil price. In the past, when crude oil, when the Saudis wanted the crude oil price to come up, they would cut production. Now, OPEC has already cut. They already declared a uh, production cut and oil prices have still fallen below $70 a barrel. So I would not be surprised if OPEC, led by Saudi, decided not to protect the oil price, let oil prices fall to their natural level to kind of knock down U.S. producers. Because U.S. shale production, even though the costs have come down a bit, they still can't produce oil at, you know, below, at or below probably 50 or 60 bucks a barrel. So... If you can get the oil price down below there and let it sit, you'll start bankrupting American producers. We saw that the last time. I mean, I've, I were hundreds of, of oil production and oil service companies went bankrupt the last time Saudi did that. I've seen it floated as an idea recently, and I believe that could be coming. So going long oil here, I think is, I don't like the risk reward on that. Yeah, Matt, and it seems like, even if the Saudi and the OPEC members really just pumped out more oil and flooded the market and drove the prices down to affect U.S. producers, there's still other countries like I just read an article yesterday that Argentina is having a shale boom and that it's going global. And there's other countries that had less production a couple of years ago in South America that have ramped back up again. So it's a global market, but there's also a global supply for it. So it makes the uh, prospects of like a runaway oil price a little more dicey. But one area of the energy space that gets more attention these days, and we have a lot of questions about it from people on our site, is the nat gas markets because it's a little more difficult to get you know a, a global nat gas market going. It's more regional. It's hard to freeze it and ship it. But there are these LNG terminals going up in Canada and the U.S. How does that level things off between North American domestic supply and what you see in Europe and Asia? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because people often, you know, oil and gas is what we say. But the fact of the matter is, you can throw oil in a barrel 
and drive it, throw it on a ship, send it somewhere. It's really easy to transport. Natural gas is not. It's super dangerous. You've got to freeze it to move it long distances. That's what the LNG is. So even if you look at like the price ranges in the U.S. at the various hubs, and there's how many, 10, 10 or 11 gas hubs, the ranges of prices, like for example, in West Texas right now, if you're an oil producer and you're putting gas in a pipeline, you're getting almost nothing for it. Whereas if you're in uh, Southern California, you're getting about, you know two and change, not quite three bucks. So you know that's a fairly big spread, and that's because in West Texas there's a lot of gas trying to get into a few pipes, and in Southern California you have a lot of demand and not enough pipes into it. So you still get these regional issues, but. When you start expanding that onto a global scale, I think you're still going to get price variances. But yes, I, I think the more infrastructure we build, the more level those prices will be. I just don't know what, I don't know how many LNG terminals and in what locations are needed. You know, if you're trying to ship gas out of central Canada and it has to go to Houston, What's the price going to be in central Canada? I mean, it's not going to be much because there's a lot of there's a lot of people that need to be involved in its transportation. The pipe across North America, you know, and it's got to be frozen in Houston and sent out west. So I think it's good news for the Europeans and the Japanese to have, you know, bigger nozzles in the U.S. to send gas into the market. And I do think that it will help consume some of that. But we just have a massive amount of gas in the U.S. and in Canada. There's just an enormous amount. There are still places in West Texas where they, they just shut wells in. The gas is stranded because, you know, it costs you money to get the gas out. That's It's just crazy. But here's the thing. I think that Europe is really going to be the driver of more nozzles of natural gas from North America heading their way because, Europe has a problem. They get most of their gas from Russia. And as we saw in the last couple of years, Russia is very willing to play political games with their nat gas prices. And so, you know, that's no good. So Europe needs more sources. We just need to build more LNG plants that we can send gas abroad. That will really help bring the prices into more equality. Man, oh man, all the bulls in the natural gas space are pointing to these LNG terminals. And it makes sense that, hey, it would be increased demand. So the price should move higher. But man, oh man, the natural gas price sure seems stuck. And that's with some of these terminals coming online in the very near term. I guess we'll see what the impact is. But you're right, Europe is going to be a main driver there. Matt, what does this mean for the overall energy complex then? If you don't see the oil price going higher, it sounds like you see it potentially going much lower. So that means that aspect of energy gets cheaper. Natural gas, who knows when it's going to move higher. But right now, that's still relatively cheap in North America. Then we tie that into this whole green initiative, right? All these other sources of energy, uranium's on everyone's radar. We still have all the other green energy sources how does the energy sector and how do energy investors make sense of it all if it sounds like we could just have cheaper energy, at least in the near term? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the understanding what you're buying is really critical. I read a piece the other day about these hedge funds on Wall Street shorting the battery complex, everything from EVs to industrial scale batteries and going long crude oil. And they're not equivalent. You know, the thing people need to understand about the energy space is that they have niches, they have utility. Oil's utility is transportation. You know, you take oil and it goes in jets and it goes in, in uh, ships and it goes in cars and it goes in trucks and it goes in, in trains. But you don't make electricity out of oil. You make electricity out of natural gas. And I was at a conference years ago and they were... It was a, you know, there was a pipeline 
segment to it. And we were sitting there listening to these guys talk about pipelines. And the thing that stayed with me all these years later is that they compared laying, I don't remember if it was 100 miles of pipe in the Gulf of Mexico or 50 miles of pipe in the Gulf of Mexico. It was easier, less expensive with less regulations to lay that pipe in the Gulf of Mexico than it was to build a single mile of natural gas transmission lines in the northeastern United States. And as long as that's true, and it's still true to this day, I promise you, then we're going to see alternative power. It's much easier to build a power line from a new nuclear power plant to residences there or from a, a solar farm to industrial batteries in those communities than it is to build new pipelines there. So there's a place for everyone here. You have to understand that that energy is a commodity and commodities are cyclical. So there are times to buy and there are times to sell. And you should understand that we call natural gas the Widowmaker for a reason. So if you're thinking about going long natural gas, you probably should just buy a lottery ticket with that money instead. It's a good point, Matt. It is a very volatile market, but I know people listening are going to want to translate this into the equity. So just wrapping up with the thoughts on the stocks, uh, we were talking before this the call that a lot of the oil and gas stocks had been more resilient to pullbacks in the underlying commodities than, say, hard rock miners are, but they would actually see a lot worse sell-off if the underlying commodity had dropped as much as oil has. Do you think that there's some safety in oil stocks for the larger dividend-paying stocks? Do you see any opportunity in oil services companies, the pipeline companies, or the drillers? Are there any areas that you think there's an edge, any areas you'd avoid as far as energy equities? Yeah, right now I'm avoiding that space entirely. I'm willing to, I'm willing to, be, to be wrong and not lose any money because the right now, what I interpret that is that the oil price has fallen and the equities have not, is that there's a lot of confidence in investors in those oil equities, or maybe there's still some greed there where they think oil prices are going to come back or they're not willing to give up that dividend. But if oil prices fall further, and if what I am concerned about with uh, OPEC letting the price go or maybe helping the price fall to kind of shut down some of the domestic production, you're going to see a wipeout and no sector in this market does wipeouts like oil. <laughs> when oil goes, you're just dead. So I'm very, I'm very reluctant to start any new positions. And if I were long oil, any of that space right now, I, I would have a very tight trailing stop on my positions. All right. Enough said there, Matt. Look, we're going to be featuring somebody on the weekend show that always talks the energy space, and he's usually quite bullish. So we'll hear what he has to say over it. But I, I hear what you're saying, especially on that whole supply side of things and just how much the U.S. has been able to produce. And, hey, I'm also just looking at the charts here. And as you outlined, we are very close to some, I think, pretty important potential breakdown levels. We'll see what could bounce it or if oil does move below there. Matt Batty Alley, again, editor of the New Energy Investor, published under the Mangrove Investor website, which we will link to in the show notes. Matt, thank you, as always, for your time. Thanks for having me.